uh, the so-called mothership. Uh, we have Ryan Fuku, how can I pronounce this? Fukunaga. Thank you. Uh, from Free Geek Toronto. We have Charlie from Free IT Athens. We have Joel Esler, uh, an academic who's been studying the organizational methods of these types of organizations and has some interesting observations. And we have Zach from uh, Free Geek Arkansas. So uh, they're going to explain to you how they make these things work, these organizations work, how you can get one started in your, your town or city, and if there's already one in your city, how you can participate. So thanks for coming. This is going to be interesting. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dan Bartholomew. I am the executive director for Free Geek in Portland. Uh, Free Geek was started in the year 2000, so we've been around for about 18 years. Uh, we started with four guys with an idea, and the idea was there is planned obsolescence in the technology market, and every two years everybody trades out what they have for technology, and it ends up wherever it ends up. It could go to China, it could go to India, it could go to a landfill. Um, meanwhile, there are 17% of the United States that do not have a device and are not connected to the internet. 39% of rural America is not connected to the internet or, or even have devices. Uh, that 39%, even if they have a device, it could be a two to five hour drive to get a new device and or get their device repaired. So they took those two problems and they, they faced them off to each other. And they said, why don't we take the devices that are perfectly fine, that are just a couple years old, refurbish them, get them to be nearly new again, and give them to the people that need them so that we can bridge the digital divide. We can get those 17% of America and 39% of rural America to start working on things like curing cancer, cleaning the water, um, removing the landfills that they're filling with these 150,000 devices that we are getting rid of every single day. Um, that was the dream. Uh, so we started out at Free Geek in Portland with about 2,000 square feet and four people. Uh, over the last 18 years, we've grown to be about 45 people in staff. We serve about 4,000 volunteers a year, uh, and we have about 25,000 square feet that is refurbishing about 1.5 million pounds of e-waste every single year. Uh, part of our mission was to try and give birth to other free geeks that are across the United States. There are 11 three free geeks across the United States one in Oslo, Norway, of all places. Um, there are about 78 nonprofit refurbishers in the United States. Um, we have a great representation here of the other free geeks that were started. Um, we are not franchising these free geeks. All we do is we provide a charter, we give them guidance, and we um, help them get started and give them guidance along the way, hopefully. Uh, to get things going and, and keep things moving as best as we possibly can. Uh, I can't tell you what this means to our community in Portland, as well as the United States. What we're doing is we're changing lives. We're changing lives by doing technology refurbishment. There was a woman that came in, she was a uh, teenager in, in high school, Kayla was her name, and Kayla came in and she gave 24 hours of community service to us, and as a result of that, we give her a computer. We give away um, thousands of devices every single year. We serve between six and eight nonprofits every single week, uh, providing them with all the technology that they need, but Kayla came in after her 24 hours of service, and I gave her her laptop, she started working on it, she was going through her class, and she was crying. And I said, Kayla, why are you crying? You just got a laptop. And she said, you don't understand. I've been doing all of my papers on my phone. 
and I've been standing outside of my school so that I had Wi-Fi connection in order to, to upload my, my papers when they were done. That's what Free Geek does. What Free Geek does is connects the world and makes a difference in that way. Um, I'm talking from my perspective. I'd really like to hear from the panel. Um, so if we could start, Zach, maybe uh, you could start a Zach um, yep. and bring us across and, and talk about what you're doing in your community. So my community in Fayetteville, Arkansas is much smaller than most of these other communities in general. We're about the tenth of the size uh, that you are. We'll do probably 150,000 pounds of e-waste this year. Um, and it's very much in the similar mold. Lots and lots of people in our community are, are rural. You know, something like 90% of the state of Arkansas is completely rural. So even though we live in an urban center, we service everyone throughout the state. We send computers to the Delta. We send um, copiers and things like that to nonprofits that otherwise, you know, couldn't have access to that tech at all. It's thousands of dollars for them. And that's usually the difference between a person and a piece of technology. So we're really fortunate in that way to be able to impact those lives. We've migrated a lot over the years from just having whole desktop computers, couldn't find a laptop anywhere, to now having some, and it's been very transformative for us. So we're able to connect with and touch thousands of people every single year, and these are people that wouldn't have any computing resources whatsoever. Thank you. Um, I'm no longer actively involved with the Free Geek organization, but uh, I did uh, work with one and the one Charlie is with now, Free IT Athens, um, for I think it was seven years or something like that. Um, and when I began working with this group, it was in this um, school building. It was basically falling apart. We had to put uh, umbrellas in the ceiling to keep water away from the servers, and uh, we had. Uh, a really good space though and I, I saw like a lot of things that were going on there um, that to me it was it was really it wasn't really about technology so much as, as it was about community building and community organizing and getting people um, the help and knowledge and understanding of technology that they need um, and I, I have so many stories to share over the years um, with uh, free IT Athens I saw it grow from that old school building to um, now like a shopping center um, which was a goal that we had had originally to get out of that building and have like a face front facing space um, And I think it's doing pretty well from what I can tell and Charlie can speak more <laughs> about that. I think Yeah, absolutely. yeah we're doing really well. Um, yeah, we, we moved to a shopping center. So we have um, Walkability people before we were in a warehouse when I got involved we were in a warehouse So we were on the bus line which if you're you're starting um, one of these organizations do keep transportation in mind being on a bus line is so so very helpful um, But we were in a warehouse so people would take the bus to come out to this warehouse There wasn't really anything unless they were unless they were recording music you know? <laughs> Nothing else out there and now you know there's there's several stores and restaurants and you know nail salons so you can come out and uh, shop and get your technology fix but no we're doing fantastic it's about 2,000 square feet um, last year we recycled um, 19 tons of e-waste which is uh, two t-rexes worth of e-waste <laughs> I learned <laughs> last year we had 126 volunteers um, serving over 5,000 hours to our community um, and we have 18 staff members which I don't know if you knew that that is no, tremendous <laughs> yeah so our staff we're an entire entirely volunteer run organization so I'm a volunteer Joel was a volunteer everyone in there was volunteering and having 18 people who are stepping up and saying okay I'm gonna take responsibility and, and leadership in this organization is just mind-blowing and I'm forever grateful um, so this year so far we've distributed 200 computers so I don't know if this is true of the other organizations but um, free software isn't our mission and that's very very important to us so so as well as bridging the digital divide um, and eliminating e-waste um, so that's 200 people who have free software in their homes um, and free software alternatives yeah so it's thank you thank you um, 
and, and we're well on track. And that's just through our store. So we have a store where computers start out at $15. We try to keep that as affordable as possible. Um, so that's not counting community grant programs, or we also give away computers to volunteers for meeting certain milestones. Um, so that's just that, yeah. And I also have so many stories um, that I wish I could share, but I'm taking too much time, so I'm gonna pass it over. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so I'm here from Free Geek Toronto. Um, pretty much everyone I said, except change pounds to kilograms, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it, the, the one big difference that, make, that, that does distinguish us slightly different from everyone else is that we've had to shift it because of the way the environment in, our, in, in, in Ontario, in the province, is we've had to switch to become a, a uh, what's called a employment social enterprise, which means that our focus is on having volunteers also help with the refurbishment and recycling, but it's also giving people the opportunity to get jobs who face barriers to employment. So you get people who, you know, have had long absences or coming into tech for as a second career, or they're newcomers to the co to the country and they don't have the Canadian, the quote unquote experience to make it in, in North America to get their first job. So they come to us and we are able to kind of give them that opportunity to kind of move forward. You know, we still have, like we sold, I think by now, this, this time of the year, we're about 200 computers like everybody else, and I can't do the conversion, but we're at about like about a metric ton of e-waste we've <laughs> done. I don't know what that is actually in pounds. Um, and it's really just kind of, so we, we do all that stuff, but it's really kind of us also incorporating this thing of like really helping people, you know, kind of get back on their feet and stuff like that. So, you know, bridging the digital divide in a way that also includes getting people, uh, you know, employment and really kind of using that, that opportunity either further into education or into other employment goals. And so, uh, yeah. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Um, I think you heard a theme across the the entire panelists that it, it's really about the community. It's about what we're doing in the community. Um, at Free Geek Portland, we, we do about 6,000 hours of education every single year. Um, and it's really about, but it's about the face that's in front of you at the time. Um, many times we're working with people that are coming out of um, challenging situations. They're coming out of homelessness. Uh, they have no device. They have no way of um, making an impact in the world that they really want to make. So teaching those basic job skills, teaching those basic, um, you know, show up on time, don't break anything, listen to your boss, take a break when you need to take a break. Um, those basic job skills is a lot of what we're doing. Um, I'd like to ask the panel, I mean, we start at Ryan and come this way this time. Um, what, it, what is the impact that you think you're making in your community? What kinds of things do you see on a daily basis? And Charlie, this is a great time to tell your stories. <laughs> So we have a core uh, staff of about eight people, and uh, all of them except for myself uh, face some kind of barrier to employment. And you, the, the we have people transitioning out of our organization, you know. So we have people like 20 people coming through because they're just kind of using us as a stepping stone and going through. And the amount of uh, you know, confidence they get from just being in, in a workplace, but being very supported and learning about tech because you know these are people who may you know. Like we have one uh, gentleman who came in who you know knew how to use a computer, but you know wasn't really that confident. And by the now he's one of our best salesperson salespeople because when people come in, he's able to empathize with their lack of tech knowledge and really kind of you know talk to them on their level while also being very honest with the uh, what the machines have to offer. And so that really kind of puts people who are digitally literate or you know not comfortable with technology in a space where they or they know that they can come here and really kind of learn from that and. You know, the, the, you can't put that and quantify how important that is to, to us for him. But uh, in terms of what we do in our community, like we really try and make sure that we're getting out into the communities that need us rather than the people who find us. Um, we, you know, because we have a lot of people come in who are, you know, tech enthusiasts, hobbyists, hackers, who really can kind of take advantage of the tech to its largest degree. But we have to really make an effort to go out to the communities where there's a little bit more social isolation or there's a language barrier, um, you know, like, like New York, Toronto has communities where people, their language is a huge barrier, and so we have to make a real effort to kind of, you know, meet somebody there who's an enthusiast in a certain community that has a language skill, who can then take our items to the community, to people who really, really need it the most, and w if they didn't have, we didn't have this kind of link with them, wouldn't even know we existed, because, you know, um, because we don't all speak, you know, a thousand languages. So yeah. So it's really that's that's really how we kind of you know Broadway kind of feel. We get into our hands. Thank you. 
So our impact in the community, I don't, don't really have a metric, I wish I did, for, <laughs> for that, but I have amazing stories. Um, yeah, so uh, employment's huge. I had no idea until I, until I started volunteering how big of a, well, of course I knew employment's a big deal, but how much a nonprofit like this can make a difference in someone's you know, job, professional life. Um, to the point where recently we've had so many people go from not having a job to gainfully employed with full benefits that are actually having trouble staying open during business hours because I can't find anyone to open oh. up. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Which is an amazing problem to have. Um, you know, one of those problems I'm grateful for. But um, yeah, language is a huge, huge barrier that, and I've definitely um, had to rope clients into um, translating for other clients. I've been in that position. But the, the little things is what um, warms my heart. So um, one of my favorite experiences is a young family came in, and um, out of respect for her privacy, I'll call her Dee, and she, she came in and she, um, with her toddler and her husband, and they were getting internet in their home for the very first time. And I got to show them the shelves and answer their questions when we picked out their very first computer. And you know, together we set up the username and password, and we learned you know how to use. We're using Lubuntu, so we you know learned Lubuntu. And she asked me if I could help her set up her very first email address. And so we set up her very first email address, and then she asked if we could work on writing a resume. And um, I still get emails from her about the job she got from writing a resume together. Um, and it's those like little, you know, face-to-face -face moments that just that that's the difference you're making in the community, and it's incredible. Now we're at the the point where we we've kind of had to look inward, so we're not doing a lot of outreach. Um, that we should be to find those communities who, who um, aren't able to find us. But in the past, and I'm sure Joel can talk about this, y'all have done amazing outreach. And I'm, I'm almost, I'm sad we didn't do the slideshows. We were gonna do a slideshow, but it would take too much time. Because I have pictures of very young Joel <laughs> in community outreach things, so. Uh, I, yeah, there's so, again, I, I probably can't pick one story. Um, um, especially since I've stepped away and, and I've looked at other uh, organizations. Um, but I am a community worker, so I have like 10 years of, of, of organizing experience in, in this area. But I, I always viewed the Free Geek model as like the food not bombs of computers. If anybody's familiar with that uh, model, is you're taking discarded computers, you're getting them to people in need. And the secret recipe there, like vegan vegetarian food with food not bombs and res rescued food, it's free software. That's what ties people to each other and community instead of like a corporation. Um, uh, but some outcomes I've seen um, from other free geeks and uh, preliminary evidence from my dissertation work has been um, actually strikingly similar to community gardens, believe it or not. Um, I've been calling them silicon community gardens because they have so many similarities. Um, there are, when you go into like a space and work together, there's a chance for like racial and ethnic class consciousness building with you. You might interact with people you had never interacted with before, right? Um, people that are neurodivergent, people that are experiencing homelessness or interpersonal violence or whatever is going on in their lives. Um, working with somebody maybe that's more privileged, um, it doesn't come from that kind of background. Um, so you have a class consciousness development. Of course the job thing is a big thing, um, but I think not everybody is coming in there, obviously, to translate this to employment. I mean, sometimes empowerment can translate to just having a better life, right? You get chosen to lead a project within the organization and you feel empowered and you were scared to talk to people, you were scared to stand in front of people before, and now you're doing it, and you can do that in other areas of your life. So I, I think that there is a lot of individual and community empowerment that can happen um, there. Uh, it can uh, bridge uh, from one space to across a large city. I found that in one of the places I was looking at. Um, and it organizes community, um, so that's within the organization, you're organizing community itself, and then outside you can community organize, right? But sometimes when you are so focused inside because of structural issues, and we'll probably get to that um, at some point, um, you're not able to reach out to the community. Um, but very quickly, Free IT Athens, we did a number of outreach projects. I tried to push for that in Athens because I did see that problem, like a lot of people coming in that were you know, maybe more privileged or we were hitting, weren't hitting certain neighborhoods or demographics that we, we need to. And as everyone um, probably knows is that 
you know, this term, the digital divide, which is an academic term, but um, it hits every marginalized population. Uh, you think of a marginalized population, they're likely um, intersected with uh, this concept of the digital divide. But to you. Yeah, sort of to dovetail on that, uh, Joel, I, you know, people work not just for money, right? Uh, people work for personal fulfillment and things like that. And um, you talk about community gardens as a, a model that's very similar to Free Geek. And I find that as well. As a matter of fact, one of our current volunteers that works with us is a community gardener, an organizer in, in creating one. And he's fell upon an unfortunate time where he can't work his normal job, but he can come and make an impact at Free Geek. And so he puts in quite a few hours and is learning and enjoying that. But that's not necessarily going to turn into some sort of, you know, corporate gig or technology thing. But that certainly has happened for many of our volunteers over the years that come in knowing something, looking for a better life, don't know how to get it, and spending enough time working, learning that they do have this skill or, or that, you know, this skill isn't something unattainable, right, refurbishing a computer or installing operating systems. But anyone can have it putting in the time with just a little bit of guidance and so having those opportunities there for anybody who wants it uh, becomes a real real changer of their lives so we have all of those communities you talked about uh, homeless people uh, those that have been out of work for a long time um, those that are just tech enthusiasts and and people who want to make an impact in their own community they spend their time willingly uh, with us we still don't quite know why uh, but we enjoy it and so <laughs> We hope that we can do a whole lot more through that. Uh, one of the big things that we've offered throughout the years that we think makes a really big impact in the community is internet access. So from our beginning as part of our mission is to guarantee that there's free and open internet access at our location and anytime we're open for anyone to use. So there's restrictions in other public facilities like public libraries, for instance, where you may be able to go in and use their internet, but you need a device. Um, or you can go in and use their devices, but for limited time frames. And we try to open that up quite a bit. We have an internet cafe where there's computers there and printers and things like that that you can just use for free as long as you need to. And plenty of people, you know, find their next cars that way or their next job or their next loved one. You know, we don't judge. Uh, and, and all of that seems to be a pretty big deal. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, the, the digital divide is, is really a four-legged stool. Yeah, you need a device, you need access, you need education, and you need tech support. Yeah. Uh, the last one is usually the one that, that kind of falls away. Uh, you can get a device, you can get access, um, you can get a little bit of education, you can get online, um, but that tech support is really important. Um, a lot of folks don't realize that, especially in rural America, uh, it could be a two and a half to four hour drive to fix a mouse. Mm -hmm. And this is an area where Google isn't a verb. You know, people don't Google things. Uh, they, may, they may want to understand something, but they can't Google it because they don't have access, or they, the access is so slow that you put into Google, and then you can walk away, make dinner, come back, and maybe you'll have the answer. But it, it takes a long time to get access. Um, I guess the, the next question I would have for the panel would be, what's the difference between what we do as nonprofit refurbishers and the for-profit refurbishers? Which um, is, a, is a whole, we battle every day against folks that'll give you $12 for a laptop. Um, and then of course, once they bring in the laptops and they process them, then they also bill back for that which they cannot turn around. Um, so it, it, it actually turns into about a zero sum game for corporations, but the corporations don't really see that. Um, so I, I really wanted to get the panel's view on us versus the, the for-profit refurbishers. And, and Charlie, you're smiling too much for me to not start with you. So I'm going to start with you. Okay. Well, we're not making money. <laughs> so all our tech support is um, drop-in, um, not drop-off, uh, donation-based tech support. And that's really, really important. So the donation-based, of course, is really important because you don't know how far these people are coming from. You don't know what they, they can offer. So um, a few dollars is great if you can. If not, that's okay. But I, I think, you know, out, outside of money, um, the, the drop 
the drop in rather than drop off is hugely important because it becomes not only a community building opportunity, um, but an opportunity for education, right? So we, for every tech support session we have, um, our, our goal is not only to solve the problem, um, but hopefully the, the client leaves knowing more than they did when, when they walked in. And, and then it becomes an empowerment opportunity, yeah. Yeah, we've taken um, at Free Geek Portland. We started with that the model of coming in, and and we do as much as we possibly can for you. But we have so many folks that come in that we started struggling with. You know, how do we take care of all these folks? So we went to a model where we have, and tech support gets a lot of interns. I don't know if you have the same experience, <laughs> but it's 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 a great launching point, and we have organizations in Portland that are now taking our graduates from our internship programs that will take them directly in and employ them. Mm -hmm. oh, awesome. And they sponsor us for that yeah. too, which mm -hmm. is awesome. Um, but we've taken and we, we put a limit on the tech support window of 15 minutes. If it goes beyond 15 minutes, then we've got volunteers that'll do one-on-ones for up to two hours. Which is awesome, right? So they, so if you if you really want to dig into a topic or somebody's really struggling with something, we take them and we put them in the classroom and they just go at it for two hours, um, which is really great. I mean, they, they move be well beyond where they came in um, in that model. Excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one of the problems that that we have in Portland, and I'm sure. The, the, I'm looking forward to hearing what the panel said. We have spent like 15 minutes together, by the way, so I'm, we are just as interested <laughs> in hearing each other's talks as you guys are to hear our talks. <laughs> um, one of the problems we have in Portland is getting corporate donations. When it comes to donations, technology is, is key for us to turn things around and get them back out. Um, we, we take in about, like I said, about 1 1.5, 1.3 to 1.5 million pounds of e-waste every year, but we can only turn around this month, we did about 30% turnaround on that. We get about 2,000 systems a, a month. Um, we were only able to turn around about 30% of that, mostly because it comes from folks. And so it's, it's been sitting in somebody's closet, it's been collecting dust, it's, it's, a, it's a white back Mac. It's from the um, <laughs> it's been around for a while, um, and we can't really turn that around. We, we must recycle in many, many cases. But from corporations that turn around their technology about every two to three years, um, and they're well-maintained, and they sit in an office space, and they're not full of you know, 10,000 years of cat hair, um, we can turn those things around pretty quickly and pretty well. Uh, but getting those corporate donations are a challenge. Uh, a lot of times corporations will say, well, you know, you're a nonprofit. How do I know that you're professional? How do, you, how do we know that you're going to, you know, handle our data securely? Uh, all of those questions. Uh, and we've done a lot in order to make sure that that's true. So we're NAID members. Um, so we, we, we make sure that we securely handle everybody's data. Anything that comes in with data, whether it's a Roku or it's a laptop or it's a desktop, we, it goes directly into our caged off secure area where we, we clean all the data. If we can't clean it, we destroy it. Um, and we take care of all those things, but getting corporations to believe in us and getting that trust level is really difficult. I'd love to hear the experiences of the panel on that. Brian, please. Yeah, um, so it's a, we've got an, so, I love bureaucracy because in Ontario there's a lot of bureaucracy around electronic waste because they really tried to make it like a huge environmental promise up there, which meant that for us to become a refurbisher or a recycle, we had to be certified by a governmental organization. So that builds an automatic level of trust there that we probably, that a lot of, I don't know, a lot of other people don't have to deal with because we can just point at something saying like, no, this, this, this body has said we're okay and that we're following all these rules, we're securely wiping your data, we're locking things up, you know, people who are handling your stuff know, have a code of con we have a code of conduct around privacy and security and stuff like that. So there's, there's all these built-in mechanisms that kind of come from just having like a piece of paper on the wall that, you know, some but check marked a couple months ago, but um, you know it really that 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 really kind of helps us, and that helps us with going to IT professionals in big corporations where we're making you know inroads, where we go to we go to both the marketing and the IT people because 
the marketing people were the good publicity, and the IT people know, you know, they kind of when they dig into us, they know we know what we're talking about. And so those two those two branches of a, a, within a corporation really kind of if they come together, they really kind of help us. We have had a uh, I can't really name them here, but like we've had a lot of corporations in Toronto who you know they just they just come and they'll dump their stuff off at us, and it's like really quality stuff. And you know, uh, graphic design firms by the way are the best mm-hmm. because they have lots yeah, of Macs absolutely. they're getting yeah. rid of every year, and it's all. Beautiful, but um, but you know, so that's really that's kind of that's kind of how we've been able to deal with it. Is that we really have to kind of we really try and target it, and we and we have a g- large group of um, supporters and our customers, the people who come in. Like we have, you know, customers from the local school board or something like that who are coming in and then saying like, oh, I'm going to turn around and go to m- the head of my department and say you should get them. And now we have a hundred French keyboards. Mm-hmm. So if anyone needs that, you know. Um, <laughs> You know, so like it's things like that. It's really just kind of making those connections, and it's really kind of s- telling people, showing people that you know this is a community. This is the, this is really going to good works. It's not just going to line somebody's pockets. Or you know, the other big thing for us is that everything gets recycled. The, the focus is on so much on recycling, on just getting rid of the stuff and breaking it down. Whereas we're like, no, 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 no. First thing we need to do, the most environmentally friendly thing to do, is to reuse. Yep. And so we focus. We really focus on that messaging. And you know, using the open, free and open source software and the community involvement and all those packages goes right together. And people just, you know, it's it's a hard sell, but you know, you get the time, you get some good results. Yeah. Zach, you want to add? Yeah. So so we almost find that uh, they take you more serious if you charge them. <laughs> uh, you know, if we offer to come and pick it up for free and something, well, there must be some scam going on. Uh, so if you're just getting started and you're having trouble with corporations, you know, charge them a token, uh, and that seems to open more doors. That's true. It's, yeah, it's amazing, it's isn't odd, it? Yeah. 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 We've gone up against national contracts, and we've said, well, we're going to do this for free. You know, we'll do the pickups. We'll take it in because, you know, if they've got 500,000 people, you know, we figure we're going to get, I don't know, 10,000 laptops a month, um, and they're like, they just don't believe us. You know, that, that we would want to do that. You know, amazing, we would do anything for free. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Um, one of the challenges that we have, um, all of us have, is the right to repair. Um, many of these organizations, like Apple, as an example, just an example, um, are very closed are very closed. Um, we can't get schematics. We can't get OEM parts. We can't get, um, they will not, they, we break warranty if we open up the machine. Um, there's a lot of uh, what we need to do in Portland is we will decompose something, um, re-engineer it, and bring it back out in order to learn it. And then we pass that on um, to our other, uh, through iFixit or through others. Um, we, we try and pass on that knowledge so that we can repair the stuff that we own because you don't really own it unless you can repair it. Um, so I'd love to hear some of the challenges across the, the panel in, in right to repair and what you're doing within your states, for, in, for instance, um, to try and get those, those laws remade uh, or in Canada. Ugh. I hate glue. <laughs> <laughs> glue is everywhere. Ugh. Um, I guess we'll, I'll start. Uh, it's it's an interesting thing because we the laws are a little bit different. Where the right to repair, there's a lot there's a lot of movement around it, especially in like the the larger cities to kind of do it. But you know the focus for us, like like in the states, I think here is more around like larger equipment, like uh, tractors and stuff like that, and trying to right. bring in electronics into that. Yep. Um, sometimes you meet it's di- diverging needs, but um, we yeah we partner with a lot of organizations that are are, are really kind of advocating for the right to repair. Um, you know, there's an organization in Toronto, uh, re- like it's part of the Repair Cafe movement, which goes around and like you know helps people repair stuff for free, and so we you know you know use them a lot, and you know we just try to through our efforts do it but uh, yeah it's it's tough Mm -hmm. yeah yeah I recently um, spoke to the Washington Congress Washington not the United States government but but Washington State about their right to repair Um, California's got a bill active Washington has a bill active Um, we're working to get a bill active in Oregon as well um, to just get right to repair Uh, because it is it impacts our business so much 
Um, Macs are in such great demand and our ability to get people graduated to the point where they can actually repair them is really difficult. Um, understanding where stuff is in a desktop and how to repair a desktop is pretty easy. Move them up to laptops and it's, it's a step above, right? But you get to Macs and it's like a whole different world. Um, so, and again, they're in such great demand that we would love to get them out to our community. So many people want to get into graphic arts or they want to get into those things that the Macs really lend themselves to that we can't, we can't bring them out to them. Um, we're, we're coming really close on time here. So I, I, I can't believe we only asked a couple of questions and then we got this far. Um, I guess the last question I have, and I'd really like to hear the entire panel on this is, um, and then I'm gonna open it up to the, to the audience because you may not have come here to hear about community and how we're working this. Uh, you may have come to hear about how to actually refurbish this stuff. Um, but I'd love to hear, what, how would you challenge this audience? What, what is the ask you have in 30 seconds, each one of you, what is the ask you have of this audience? What is it that you'd like for them to take back with them when they go back to the real world? Zach, you want to start? Sure. Well, when you go back out there, uh, you know, feel emboldened and empowered. Uh, I, I think this is probably true of most of the organizations. We started with a hope and a dream, you know, no idea how the next month's rent would be paid or whatever, but we all had a conviction that this was meaningful and a good thing. Uh, so if you feel so inclined, find a few people, figure out how to pay rent, find a cheap place and start doing what you already do out of your own closets and, and grow it into something a little bit bigger. Um, and if you can help organizations like ours find better equipment, get into our hands, please do. And we'd also love to work with anybody on legislation around this right to repair. Uh, in Arkansas last time it was shot down by Dell and Apple. Uh, there's nothing pending today and uh, we need some help doing that. Um, I just have some recommendations. If you're going to start one, um, I would highly recommend doing a community analysis with people, like affected people. So if, uh, community analysis takes a long time too. Don't half-ass it. Um, when in this process, be understanding, listen, and step back uh, throughout the whole process. Be inclusive, be welcoming. Uh, understand this is community organizing. It's not a computer or tech club and that this should be your ultimate goal, right? To meet human and uh, need. Uh, never lose sight of your vision, mission, or your purpose of your project. Um, ask yourself in every step of the way that you do, every decision you make in an organization, how is this fitting into what we're setting out to do? How is it furthering it? Um, allow as much as possible service, user, and marginalized population um, leadership and organizing. Never take money from a funding source that is going against your mission or your vision. Um, and have fun. <laughs> Thank you. So my, my challenge to you is, um, so I am not a technical person. I tell people I'm technical adjacent. <laughs> I'm technical adjacent, I'm around it, but I don't know what I'm doing with it. Um, I have no experience in the nonprofit sector. I've only been volunteering for two years and it's happenstance and how I'm doing what I'm doing today. So if I and my fellow volunteers can make an impact on our community, then every single person in this room is so well equipped to to help their their fellow you know neighbors and community members so i definitely challenge you and even if it's not you know starting a free geek like organization you know listen out you know everyone needs help with fixing their laptop and their devices you know you can make a difference um yeah so i challenge you to look for those opportunities uh i think the big thing to take away is that if you're going to start this remember one key thing ask for help yourself mm. There are lots of things that you won't know how to do and that there are already people in the communities or in large organizations or bureaucracies who will be, you know, have a kind ear to listen to what you want to do and what you want to support. And they can offer guidance and support and intangibles that are not there. You never know, you know, in what pockets of area you'll find somebody who, you know, knows somebody who knows somebody who can, you know, get you in touch with a, a landlord who's, uh, you know, kind to what you're gonna do, or uh, knows a group that, you know, can really get you locked into an actual community that really could use the services that you are gonna offer. And, uh, you know, if you're not open to, to getting help yourself, it will be, it, it's just, it's too much harder to do it alone. You gotta do it with others. Excellent point. Yeah, there are 78, 
nonprofit refurbishers in the United States, and Free Geek is is one of them. Um, I I I have a call probably once a week. I probably spend one to two hours a week helping other free geeks, helping other nonprofit refurbishers get up and running, um, advising on everything from policies to procedures to you know trainings to education. We freely share our ed our education curriculums. Um, like I said, we do 6,000 hours of education. Um, we share all of that curriculum. We talk about how to manage the teaching, manage the, the volunteers that we have, manage the volunteer teachers, um, how to get public schools involved so that you've got places for the children. You know, our, our, our children are remarkably unequipped. 60% uh, of the uh, Portland area schools are not equipped at home in order to do schoolwork. Um, their, their parents can't check their grades, They're, they can't talk to their teachers. Homework is always assigned now online. Um, uh, so we, we talk through how to get involved in that and how to get, get this information out. So if you are interested in starting one of these up, please reach out. Every one of us would field a phone call. Every one of us would freely share information if that's what you're interested in doing. Um, my challenge to you is go back to your real world. If you're working for those corporations that are out there or working for or have a network that includes that, please talk to them about what we are trying to do. Um, it is a huge benefit for them from a um, social, social networking perspective, um, a corporate social responsibility perspective. But it's also just the right thing to do. We need to refurbish these things and get them out to people that need them. Um, so that is my challenge to you. Um, I am almost completely out of time. If there are any questions from the audience, please, I'd love to hear them. Uh, hi, I'm, uh, I'm the founder of a company called Neverwhere, and we kind of set out to do something similar um, with, with an operating system. And what we found was that when we tried giving people Linux, there were many people who were very, uh, you know, their eyes kind of glazed over. Uh, and when we switched to Chromium and we told people, oh, hey, this is going to turn your 10-year-old computer into a Chromebook. You know, they suddenly connected, especially in schools where, you know, Google is in every single school yeah. nowadays. Have you guys, uh, you know, tried uh, or had any success with Chromium? No, free software is so, so very important. <laughs> yeah. So, no, haven't touched it. Yeah. Yeah. Free software. And it just takes time. you got to sit with people, you know? And... Um, and they'll adopt. They will. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a little disingenuous to call it a Chromebook. Also, um, just a comment. We um, we distribute Linux on all of our um, computers that we put out. Um, we've recently become a Microsoft authorized refurbisher as well. Um, and the reason that we've done that is because a lot of our folks that we're helping get back into the workforce, when they get back into the workforce, they need to have that that Microsoft experience. Um, it causes havoc in the shop with all the drivers you've got to have and the updates you've got to have and the virusware you've got to have. I mean, but, and, and we try and explain Linux is on the space station. <laughs> I think they know what they're doing. Um, <laughs> um, and most of our people do accept Linux as we put it out. I'm sorry? We do, yeah. We, and we, we have, too. <laughs> All yeah. of them. Every Mac we yeah. sell has Ubuntu on it. Hey, guys. Um, so when I was in school, I volunteered at the Cincinnati Computer Cooperative, uh, the other CCC. Um, and and we, did, uh, we did a lot of e-waste recycling. Uh, we had a lot of problems where we would just, you know, we'd get huge pallets of computers, especially those Macs that are fucking impossible to take apart and get the hard drive out of them. Um, but a lot of the computers that we'd refurbish, and we'd even put windows on them occasionally because that's what people were used to, we couldn't sell them, you know, it was, things were too slow for people. At what point do you determine when something needs to be recycled versus, um, uh, you know, sold or, or given to people? Um, how do you 
make, have the discussion. Um, also, if you have time, like, what's the weirdest thing that you've gotten in? We've got a lot of weird stuff. So Yeah, that, that's an ongoing thing. <laughs> yeah, so please. so we, we've had this issue at Free Arkansas quite a bit. Uh, we had a hard time when we were early on getting things that were performant uh, at all. But we, we were lucky enough to have enough equipment to draw from now that our benchmark is if YouTube is not a slideshow, yeah. it's an effective machine. Right? <laughs> if you can learn from videos on the Internet publicly posted by other people, that's good enough. Yeah, we, we do the same thing. We, we evaluate our spec probably monthly. Um, and right now we're at i5 or i7 and above. Um, wow. Eight gigs. Oh, of lucky. <laughs> Jeez. And, Someday. Uh, right. But the, you know, what we do with everything else that we get is we palletize it and we put it back out. Yeah. Okay. So we're able to get it to other refurbishers that, that are able to, to take on that much. Um, we just get too many systems. We can't. We can't possibly push them around. Awesome. Yeah. We're at Core Two or bust. Yeah. Core Two Duo is here too. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Weirdest yeah. one. <laughs> but a Mac Mini uh, that's still up and running today with PPC Linux. Yeah. 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 And we do get very cool stuff in. Uh, a lot of like the the Redback Macs, and um, we get a lot of ham radio. We get a lot of vintage radio. Um, we've got relationships with. Uh, clubs throughout the United States that, that are vintage clubs that take on Commodores, um, of all things. Yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing the stuff we get in. Yeah, I, got got computer, sorry, I got a computer cars. full of roaches once. Yeah. Um, wasps. But, I got wasps. But, but this, uh, this woman came back with roaches again, which I just gave her another computer. I was like, whatever, you know, we'll yeah. got an extra one, we'll make sure you get it. But uh, this led to trying to find out like, where this person was living. You know, and checking up on them and sure. seeing, like, and the place was in a really bad shape. Um, so we went to try to find a person to help, you know. So there are avenues to, that you don't even expect to, to happen through just a computer. You yep. Know? I got a top, top Gun joystick. That's my coolest thing. <laughs> I got to Yeah, we've gotten, we've gotten, like, live beehives in yep, computers. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we've gotten alcohol. We've gotten guns. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I haven't yeah. had that problem. <laughs> We had bullets, not guns. <laughs> We've had both. Bullets, We've had yeah. bullets as well. Yeah. Oh gosh. Um, know, not so much a question, more of a comment. Oh, there was re recently a ruling from the FTC about warranties and the warranty stickers. Uh, it was back in either April or May that the, not only the stickers meaningless, but they're also illegal. Um, the various companies that were named in the suit were Microsoft, Nintendo, HTC, and I forget what the other Sony. The last one was. Sony. Um, I know for, uh, Apple wasn't named in it. Um, I'm sure FTC is probably looking at them too. I don't know if you guys have any comments on that um, as far as uh, right to repair. Anybody want to feel it? I mean, the, the few Macs that we've repaired that might have still had warranty status never then had their warranty exercised after the fact, so we have no real direct knowledge. Usually by the time we see them, there's no warranty still hanging. So. Yeah, that's Not usually true for us, too. Yeah, yeah. We, um, we give six months of free tech support for anything that's purchased from our store online. We do one year of service oh, wow. for anything that we donate um, or grant to others. Yeah. So that kind of makes that go away for us. So, so there's often a trade-off between speed on old machines and usability and ease of use. Uh, you have mentioned Lubuntu. Is that what most of you have come down on, or just wondering what, what distros you've picked? I feel like I'm unique in the Lubuntu. I mean, we used it for a register for a while, because oh, it was the slowest okay. machine in the whole building. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but we stand on Ubuntu. We try to stay on the latest LTS as much as we can. It depends on hardware compatibility. Linux Mint, because it looks like Windows. <laughs> yeah, no, people love it. People do. Yeah. It. No, it's true. It's, it's, it's really, it's like, it, like, it's so, because it does everything and it looks the exact same, people, like, the, the barrier to entry on it is, they just think it's a green theme. And we have to tell them, no, no, no. It's actually something else. But, yeah, so, Linux Mint, I think we're on, we just, we're on 18, too. We haven't gotten to 19 yet. Yep. We're on 18 as well. Yeah. Yep. Ubuntu was a free IT choice because Ubuntu started the Amazon uh, spy thing. So we wanted to get away from an interface that had that as a default. That was a decision why we used like a different uh, desktop environment. And it's lighter. Yeah. 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 It is yeah. lighter. Unity. Uh, so I guess that's a good uh, segue into my question. So I'm, I'm curious about how you guys balance um, usability with getting people into the sort of panopticon of Google and 
you know, uh, this sort of, and how do you deal with that in terms of harm reduction? Like, where do you draw the lines? How do you struggle with it? If you know what I mean? Yeah? Oh, Could, yeah. 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 Could so, you for example, you can help people start? get into a computer, but then they can quickly sort of get subsumed in advertising and being tracked and sort of have all these other problems that are really counter to the ethos of free software and free is in liberty. Just, maybe you don't struggle with it at all? The answer is no. No, I'll, I'll speak from Portland at yeah. first, if you guys want to sure add in. Yeah. Um, we give classes on that. Um, so part of our, when you come through and you, you are given a, a computer or you're getting started class, um, includes a whole section on security as well as how to safely navigate the internet. Um, and that's, that's the way that we try to do it is through education. Yeah. 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 We try to do it through education as well. Most of ours is informal rather than formal, uh, but we do as much as we can with, with new users getting their first computers to at least let them know that they should look further into these things and don't just click accept on yeah. terms of service. Uh, I know they're daunting, but they're at least worth a read, and if it makes you want to throw up once, probably say no. Yeah. I'm sorry we have to wrap this up, but for everyone in our audience and everybody who's going to be watching the archive version of this online later, um, and who's everybody's there watching the live stream now, how can people get more involved with this? Uh, Dan, um, is there a central point of contact uh, where they can be uh, referred to either a free geek or like organization in their community or with uh, resources on how they can start something like this in their community? Absolutely. We, um, at, at Free Geek in Portland, we are, we are known as the mothership. <laughs> So we provide a lot of information if we are ever, ever contacted by anyone. I'm sure the rest of my panelists would also welcome. Um, but if you do info at freegeek.org, um, you can easily reach us. Um, also, there's, a, there's an organization that's out there called AFTR, A-F-T-R-R.org. It's part of the Christina Foundation. And they are, the, they are a uh, consortium of the nonprofit refurbishers across the United States. They're a great source of information as well. Thank you. Thank you. This was great. Great job. Oh, thank you. You really did well. I wish we had two hours. I know. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, very well done. Sorry, I just went on track. No, no, I'm glad you did. I would have kept on going. So the big bump on this, I mean, there weren't a ton of people here um, Sunday morning, whatever, but this, this was streamed.